thank you all for being here. Uh, I know how busy each of you are because we're all uh, really trying to do every day what we can to help the women and children and fathers and children who are coming to our country to seek safety. Um, before we begin, Joyce Hamilton is from the Valley. And uh, she has an interesting story. She and other individuals on their own went to the bridge when there were these long lines of people camping out on the bridge trying to get into the United States. Anyway, she went there. They were all just taking water. Blankets were really good. And then they finally found each other. And actually, Sister Denise and I were down there when they had their first meeting, and they saw each other face to face before you just been texting, I think. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I mean, you've been talking in collaborator time, but anyway, so they uh, established the Angry Tias, and then they changed yeah. it to Angry Tias <laughs> and uh, Abuelas, yeah. So uh, they are using their anger in a positive way, and she'll let us know a little bit more about that. Okay, are there any other folks here that are new? Lewis, uh, we will introduce you when it's time to speak. I don't see you there. Oh, here you are. Any other folks? Yes, sir. All right. Oh. Nikki Robertson, Northwood Presbyterian. Nice to have you. Thank you. Tracy was one of our founding folks. Yes. Tracy said, oh, Gloria Sasser, League of Women Voters, Texas Issue Chair, and I'm also the Legislative Chair for uh, Texas New Life. Wow, thank you for being here. Wow. Yes. My name is Kay Lorraine. I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. I've been here, uh, I've, I took a leave of absence from my law firm, and I've been here most of the summer uh, uh, working for Reasis and, uh, and picking up families, working bail bond court and picking up families or people from uh, Taylor, Texas or, 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 or uh, all of the different detention centers around and taking them to the bus stations, to the, to the, to the airports, whatever, and, um, and things are slowing down, so now I'm looking forward to working with you. Yes, ma'am. Wendy Holbrook. I'm uh, part of Covenant Baptist Church, and oh. we offer sanctuary. Yes. And then I'm also coordinator for Interfaith San Antonio Alliance. Thank you. Here. Ah, sir? Yeah. I'm Jonathan Fink. I'm uh, Social Action Chair at Temple High. I'm here with my rabbi, David Komarovsky. He's oh. actually been here before, but yes. this is my, it's my first time. Thank you. Thank you, David, for bringing me. Carlos Valadez. Louder. Yeah, you have to speak loud. <laughs> Carlos Valadez. Valadez. I'm here with Holy Trinity, and you can blame uh, Linda's email for having me here. <laughs> and she is one of our faithful backpack volunteers. Thank you for coming. Anybody else? Here. Hi, I'm Morgan Claser with Texas Lutheran University. Oh, um, yes. This is Dr. Jennifer Mata. We're just here to learn more and see how TLU students can get involved. I'm so glad you're here. See, I've spoken to him on the phone, but yes. I've not ever seen it. That's what happens. You text or you call, but you don't see faces. <laughs> Always a shock. This, there's somebody over here, but wow. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jeremy Pummel, and I am a pastor up at Lighthouse uh, Church in, uh, in Stoneham. Okay, well, good. Thank you for being yeah. here. Anybody? Yes? Hi, I'm Christina Mendez. I'm with this we work with K through 12 schools, universities, and specifically. Oh, you said you're going to talk in the side of Yeah. So I just, that's another person I've seen. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Anybody else? Well, I'll tell you, you know, things are not as dire as I was concerned they might be. It's okay. This is just something. Don't trip off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but because I was anticipating this day, and I'm actually anticipating my Sunday school class on Sunday, what we're going to talk about. But um, this is a book that I have loved for many years. It's called Gorillas of Grace by Ted Loader. And I think Ted is, was a Methodist pastor. But anyway, he has written, he and Henry now both can speak my heart so much better than I can. And so many times when I'm needing to pray and I just can't, I can read one of these prayers and it allows me to um, receive comfort. So I'm going to read this today. And it's called... Sometimes it just seems to be too much. Gracious God, it just seems to be too much. Too much violence, too much fear, too much of demands and problems, too much of broken dreams and broken lives, 
Too much of war and slums and dying. Too much of greed and squishy fatness and the sounds of people devouring each other and the earth. Too much of stale routines and quarrels, unpaid bills and dead ends. Too much of words lobbed in to explode and leave shredded, shredded hearts and lacerated souls. Too much of turned away backs and yellow silence, red rage and the bitter taste of ashes in my mouth. Sometimes the very air seems scorched by threats and rejection and decay until there is nothing but to inhale pain and ex exhale confusion. Too much of darkness, Lord. Too much of cruelty and selfishness and intolerance. Too much, too much, too bloody, bruising, brainwashing much. Or is it too little? Too little of compassion, too little of courage, of daring, of persistence, of sacrifice. Too little of music and laughter and celebration. Gracious God, make of me some nourishment for these starved times, some food for my brothers and sisters who are hungry for gladness and hope, that being bread for them, I may also be fed for be full. Amen. Uh, I'm going to ask Terry Burton, who is uh, one of our collaboration uh, leadership, and he's going to introduce our speaker. It's my, very much my honor to introduce Luis Figueroa, who is with the Center for Public Policy Priorities. Uh, <coughs> signing out of Austin, I'm thinking. Uh, Luis Figueroa joined the, the Center in 2018 as the first legislative and policy director. He oversees the CPPP's comprehensive legislation lesson study strategy. Sorry. He was previously general counsel for the Texas State Senator Jose Rodriguez and an executive director of the Texas Senate Hispanic Caucus. Previously he served as the legislative attorney for the Me Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, MALDE, uh, where he worked from 20, 2004 to 2013. From El Paso, uh, Luis has received awards from Maldef, Rulat, and Representative Joaquin Castro, among other honors. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Speech Communications with a concentration on American politics and law from Trinity University in San Antonio, and his Juris Doctorate from the University of Texas School of Law. He's licensed to practice law in the state of Texas. And this week especially, uh, when we start talking about priorities and where we all want to start focusing, we are very honored to have you with us. Thank you, Luis. Appreciate it. Well, let me uh, first say what an honor it is to be here. Um, you know, I'm involved, uh, as mentioned, in the policy fronts, uh, both here in San Antonio and El Paso and then in Austin. Uh, but I can't thank the direct service providers that are on the front lines, uh, giving water, providing legal services, doing everything they can for the immigrant community, uh, regardless whether it's here in San Antonio or in the Valley or El Paso. Um, you guys are the true heroes. Um, yeah, I'm blessed to see a lot of good friends here. Uh, Lee Ferran, who has done amazing work, is one of my personal heroes. So uh, I'm so glad to be here, and it's an honor. What I wanted to just talk a little bit about is some of the threats and opportunities that are coming up in the next legislative session. As you know, we, uh, we meet uh, every other year, and uh, every other year uh, it seems to be another onslaught of anti-immigrant bills and legislation, uh, and it takes a Herculean effort uh, to defeat a lot of that legislation. Uh, we came up uh, short last session uh, with a bill called Senate Bill 4 that we'll talk about, um, but we anticipate another uh, session where immigration will play a role. And what I just wanted to um, just say uh, on the onset is that uh, your activation, whether it's an electoral or on the ground, is so crucial to the legislative front. Um, so now I'm the Director of Senate Public Policy Priorities. If you're not familiar with it, uh, it's easier sometimes to say CPPP, 
Uh, we are, have a really long tongue twister, but it, we are commonly referred to as the CPPP. We do uh, policy work on a number of fronts. Uh, budget, education, healthcare uh, are our mainstays. Uh, over the last few years, we have become more involved on the immigration front uh, because we believe in a Texas where all Texans, regardless of immigration status, regardless of where inside of town you are, um, should be able to have uh, a healthy life, access to education, and an opportunity for economic growth. So that's our fundamental uh, principles, and, uh, and immigration uh, has increasingly become a part of that. So uh, let me just say, some of this is a little hard to read, so I'm just going to uh, explain uh, just kind of where we are on this. So this is uh, some of the policy threats and that we are expecting to see um, next session. And so the big one is the state enforcement of immigration laws. Uh, we already passed Senate Bill 4 last session. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it was the one that they called the so-called Sanctuary Cities Bill. Some people called the Show Me Your Papers Bill. Uh, it essentially encouraged local law enforcement to engage in immigration uh, enforcement and created some uh, incentives and threats uh, for uh, universities, local jurisdictions, um, if they discourage people from enforcing immigration laws. Um, so the next line that we're going to see next session, they've already had some interim hearings on it, is a provision of the Immigration Nationality Act called 287 Gs. 287 Gs are uh, a direct provision that allows for local law enforcement to do immigration work. Um, in a way, it's a little bit better than what they're doing in sanctuary states, at least they're getting trained, but it is a huge threat because um, that means they can actually do immigration enforcement. It does cost some money for the counties to enter into a 7G agreement with the federal government. Um, so the legislature is looking at trying to make it easier to enter into these arrangements, uh, which would just further blur the line between local and federal enforcement of immigration laws uh, and create more fear of reporting crimes, more fear of who you go to when, uh, when you are experiencing a victim or you're a witness to a crime. Um, so the other area that we see is denial of rights and protections um, to immigrant populations. Um, this one you'll most likely reference uh, the DREAMers. So Texas, as you all may remember, was the first state in 2001 to pass in-state tuition for uh, undocumented uh, students uh, here in Texas. Uh, subsequently, uh, I believe we're up to 13 states have now adopted it. Um, every year we have to defend that law. Every year where it's a fight, um, and the last big fight was in 20, uh, 2015, we had a big uh, push to try to repeal that law, uh, and they couldn't get a hearing in state affairs because the chairman there was, did not want to see the bill. They couldn't get a hearing in higher education. You know, this is a bill about in-state tuition, the, the amount of money you pay to college. So they put the bill in border security. Uh, because they, apparently the dreamers were a threat to our our you know our border security and to our uh, Texas. Uh, it was the only place they could get a hearing, uh, and the overwhelming opposition. There were hundreds of students and activists and faith-based groups like you all who came and showed up and testified against it. To maybe a handful, I think it was like two or three people who testified in favor of it. By the end of the hearing, the chairman of the committee. Uh, your own Senator uh, Campbell, who represents part of North uh, uh, San Antonio here, uh, Alma Heights area, was saying, was backtracking out of the bill, was saying, well, it's not really about the students, it's really just about rule of law, and was you know, trying to come up with excuses about why this bill was being pursued. Um, and it was, it was such a disaster that I think it's become clear how popular this law here is in Texas, but that doesn't mean it's the threat goes away. We still expect that despite the overwhelming testimony and benefits economically to the students, economically to the state, uh, to the universities, to the colleges, that we'll see a, a bill to repeal it as well. Or they'll go after their ability to get Texas um, state grants, the, uh, the, the financial aid that allows them to, to attend these universities. Um, and then we saw one a couple of sessions ago where they were medically fragile kids. So these are the kids with the most severe disabilities um, they wanted to put the undocumented children at the back of the line to receive services um, that medically fragile uh, kids are entitled to. Um, that bill I passed the House and we had to defeat it in the Senate at the very last second uh, in 2015. Um, so that's always a threat. So these are the bills that are trying to take away protection for freedoms um, from undocumented. And the last one is about penalties. 
um, or fees. Um, so we saw this uh, increasingly appear in different parts of law. Uh, it's called e-verify, e-verification, uh, where they try to, uh, it's already law for government agencies, but now there, there'll be an, uh, potentially an expansion to private industry uh, where you have to verify your employees through the e-verification system or suffer some type of penalty or loss of, uh, of a license. Uh, if you didn't. So that's a bill we see every session as well. These are just some of the threats that we'll see um, as we go along. So um, I wanted to just kind of give a real quick recap of Senate Bill 4 last session. What happened um, and, and what, where, where we are with it right now. So Senate Bill 4, as I mentioned, was the you know, show me your papers bill last session. It was a, government, uh, the governor's priority item last session. Uh, it really started when um, uh, Austin and other cities um, uh, were, ex were taking a more aggressive stand against ICE uh, and the governor um, fought back against it. He tried to pin the label on um, Sheriff Lupe Valdez, um, but she was honoring every single detainer pretty much in Dallas County and the label really didn't hit, really didn't stick. Um, then it came to Austin with Sally Hernandez um, saying that she wasn't going to honor all the detainers. The, the detainer is when somebody goes into the prison system and ICE, um, the federal government, sends a, a form and says, hey, we want you to hold on to somebody um, because we want to see if they um, have um, status or they're criminal or they have some issues. Um, and uh, Austin came up with a policy that said, we aren't going to do that if, they, if it's not a serious crime. You know, they tried to limit the amount of detainers they were going to do, which you know, was pretty much in line with the goals of, of um, enforcement. You know, the goal wasn't to detain every single person, but to really be focused on people who are committing the, the more serious crimes. Um, but the governor um, got, you know, kind of flipped out about it and determined this was going to be a priority item for next session. Unfortunately, the bill expanded beyond detainers. It got into uh, local law enforcement and enforcing things on the ground. Um, the bill sailed through the Senate in the first uh, two months of the session before uh, we even really, you know, most of the time bills don't start moving until March. They moved in February. Um, and in the House, where we thought things were going to get better, it really didn't. Uh, it turned into a really ugly fight on the floor. There was a provision about when you can inquire about immigration status is at the point of detention or the point of arrest. For those of you that are lawyers, know that that's an important distinction. Um, and unfortunately, the, the standard went back to the point of detention. Uh, it really showed the true colors of the legislature. Um, and unfortunately, that's how the bill passed. Um, and it's now in litigation. Um, the courts have struck down one provision that talks about um, encouraging local law enforcement. They had a provision that was so broad that basically when we asked the senator or the author of the bill what it meant, he said, we're trying to get at the wink, wink, nod, nod culture of police departments. Uh, and that was the standard that he was uh, declaring about what discouraging local law enforcement was. Um, the court you know, correctly figured out that was just too broad, not enforceable, uh, and struck that provision down. Unfortunately, the rest of the law is in place uh, it's going back to trial court to look at some of the racial intents of the bill and whether there's some violations there. Um, and it's also on appeal on the other provisions on the, on the injunction um, that Judge uh, Orlando Garcia had initially put in place but was overturned by the appellate court. So I just wanted to let you know that's kind of where things stand. There will be bills next session to limit S. Senate Bill 4, uh, for example, removing universities. Uh, creating safe places, uh, removing the standard back from arrest to detention. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult to get traction on some of those bills, but it's important to keep it on the record, to keep showing that we're trying to improve on the bill, and hopefully we can get a hearing or two on some of those, on those bill bags. Um, so, the other major bill from last session, and I know many of you all, I remember you all, many of you all testified on this, it was a bill we, uh, uh, unaffectionately called baby jails. Uh, this revolves uh, family detention centers. Um, we, as you all know, Carnes and Dilly uh, are one of the few family detention centers uh, in the nation, um, and they're both here in Texas, both pretty close to here, south of San Antonio. Um, and um, essentially, uh, the, the big picture thing is that the federal government was limiting the amount of time um, immigrants, families, particularly children, could be housed in a family detention center under an agreement called the Flores Agreement. 
Um, and the state was trying to get around that provision, that law, by saying if we license the detention center as a child care facility, and then we can meet the standards under Flores and we can keep these people in these detention centers for a longer period of time. So it was an end around a federal court settlement um, and essentially these children, these babies, are put in a jail-like setting for an extended period of time It has tremendous psychological effects on these kids. Um, is um, the reports that we got in the testimony and, and many of you all who do the work and probably talk to this, particularly you all at Raices. Um, but essentially um, these kids are, uh, there's uh, instances of sexual abuse, there's medical treatment that's not being provided to these kids. Um, even if those conditions were improved upon, just the psychological effect of putting them behind bars, of being unable to move around, has tremendous psychological and the and pediological society came out really strong in opposition. We thought we had the votes to kill this in committee. Even some of the most strident Republicans had some issues with this. Uh, it went to the Senate floor. We had the votes to kill it there too. Um, and unfortunately, a, re, uh, a Republican in Houston switched their vote at the very last second to allow the bill to move forward in the Senate. Um, thankfully, the bill died in the House State Affairs Committee. Um, but now, with a new speaker, as you all know, Joe Strauss from San Antonio is no longer going to be our speaker next session. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to the committees, um, particularly the really crucial House State Affairs Committee, which is where most of the most egregious anti-immigration bills die. Um, and uh, because of Chairman Cook, who had a very strong Catholic upbringing uh, and as a result would hold up a lot of the anti-immigrant bills with the exception of Senate Bill 4. Um, and so now with him retired, with a new speaker, we are at the, the importance of mobility and the importance of activation of faith-based groups is more important than ever um, because we just don't know what's going to happen in these committees with a new speaker. So. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about 287G already, so we don't need to re-talk about it, but I did want to mention that they've also looked at trying to bring multi-states into an interstate compact to do border security work. This is a bill that came up two sessions ago. It didn't get much traction by Senator Hall, um, but it could potentially come up again and we might need some mobilization, particularly you all on the border who can talk about the concerns about border security and wrongful enforcement on the border. Uh, and then uh, we talked about in-state tuition already. Senate Bill 1819 was the bill that failed last time that they tried to put through the Veteran Affairs and Border Security hearing. Um, again, we'll see that again next session. Hopefully it'll die again, um, but the dreamers are an important part of this work. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the children who were put in the back of the line for medically fragile kids. Um, and that's that bill right there. That was HB 2835 from the 2015 session. Um, nearly passed, um, so one will have to stay marginalized. And I think the message on this one is, this was a bill that nobody noticed in committee hearing. It got all the way to the floor before somebody noticed it. Um, and it became really, it got a lot harder to kill at that point. So um, we always have to stay vigilant and, and we're going to try our best to keep you all in the loop about these types of bills that come out of nowhere. Um, another bill that has come up in the years past is requiring proof of citizenship to register to vote. Um, document, they call it documentary proof of citizenship. Um, this, is a, this is an effort led by Chris Kobach, um, who was just recently defeated for the governor of uh, Kansas. Uh, he was going around different states and communities trying to pass these anti-immigrant laws. Uh, he was behind the Farmers Branch uh, anti-immigrant legislation they did in Dallas. Um, and so this is an effort to really restrict the ability to register to vote. It would completely, it would decimate third party voter registration. Uh, because people don't have their passports and their birth certificates with them when they register to vote. Um, so this would um, be a, a huge hit to our ability to register uh, people to vote. Uh, it hasn't gotten a lot of traction in recent sessions, uh, but it has been filed pretty continuously every session. Um, so um, depending again on the new speaker, on the, on the new chairs, uh, we have to stay vigilant on it. So, Federal level, too much to talk about. Uh, there's uh, too much going on in the feds. I just want to give you a list of things that are kind of up there that CPPP has been working on. Uh, public charge rules. These are new rules that would make it harder to get your green card uh, based on the amount of income that you have, uh, based on whether you, your family has applied for benefits. It's really a, an attempt to scare people to apply for, for public benefits that they're eligible for for their children. And it's really a... Uh, 
an attempt to scare people away from applying for their, for their green card as well. Um, the census citizenship question, you all may have heard about that one. Um, we're very concerned about that and the impact of having an undercount on the census that's coming up in, in two years. Um, the quota settlement I mentioned earlier, they're trying to uh, get around that on the federal light side too with new rules there. Um, DACA is always, this is the deferred action for childhood arrivals. Uh, these are the dreamers. Um, we are hanging on by a thread in the litigation to keep DACA. Um, any day now a decision can come down that's, that completely ends DACA um, and it's going to become an issue in Congress all over again uh, and we'll have that whole discussion of wall and DACA enforcement versus you know providing the DREAM Act and all of that discussion that we had uh, a, year, a year or two ago. Detention and family separation, there's plenty of people in the room who can tell you what's going on with that, but coming from El Paso, I can tell you um, that it's not looking good. There's, um, you know, the tent city there is still operational and, um, and there's continuously concerns about the growth of, of um, families either being separated or detained or the standards not being met in, in ORR shelters. Um, the zero tolerance on the border as well. Uh, these are the asylum claims that, um, and people who come across the border because they're deterred from coming across the port and they come across another area and they immediately are prosecuted and prevented from being able to apply for their asylum claims. Uh, and of course the new one we just heard Trump, the birthright citizenship, uh, which is, you know, in my opinion, blatantly unconstitutional, but with the Supreme Court you never know and uh, it's a threat and so we need to be vigilant of it, uh, although I think it's more of a distraction than a than a real attempt to do something, but you never know what this was in. Um, and so, it's not all bad. We do have some opportunities. I didn't want to come away with the ending of like, oh, it's so dire, we're never going to be able to do anything. So real quickly, um, Representative Cook has tried to pass legislation for undocumented to get access to driver's license or driver's permits. Um, with the new 12 Democrats and with the new speaker, maybe there's light for this again. Uh, maybe it's time to push this, uh, this effort again. This is a mixed bag a little bit because it puts an identifier on the license. Um, so some people are concerned that they might be identified as, as undocumented, but also the, the people being arrested for not having a license is the most common way to get put into the system. So um, there's a lot of benefits to it as well. Um, so I wanted to draw that to your attention. Uh, there are now um, recommendations in the sunset bill for the Department of Public Safety to put accountability on border security. Um, and so we actually can have some metrics of what they're looking at and what their metrics of success are. Um, so that's a positive step and hopefully that will pass this session so we just don't have uncontrolled numbers of DPS troopers and federal troopers and state and county and local policemen just uh, infiltrating every aspect of the, of the border community. Um, and the, on the local level is really where the action is. Um, so um, there's efforts to end contracts with detention centers, there's efforts to uh, locally to um, focus in on individuals who are being wrongfully detained or who need to be released. Um, there's efforts on resistance on uh, freedom cities, like for example in Austin, to reduce the number of people being arrested across the board so that they don't get put into the system. Um, but it all happened on the local level, cities, counties, universities, um, that's really where our best opportunities are right now. And so all the efforts you do locally um, are, are crucially important as well. And lastly, some resources for you. I was a co-founder of the Trust Coalition, which is a coalition of faith-based groups, uh, business groups, civil rights group, LULAC was one of the founding uh, groups along with, uh, with Maldev and, and some of the other groups. Uh, if you're interested in getting in touch with them, they have a Facebook page there, Facebook Trust Coalition. Uh, Fatima Menendez at Maldef helps run that list. Um, if you don't know her, uh, I can get you in touch with her and she can get you on the list and get you activated. They're the ones who are really the inside capital coalition that are following all the bills and activating groups on the different committees. Um, so you really want to get into the legislative front, not federal, not the local stuff. But the Texas Legislature um, Trust is the, is the group to go to uh, for that. Uh, and of course, um, also, um, you can always contact us at CPPP. Um, and, uh, oh, I meant to put my email on there, but it's uh, Figueroa at CPPP.org. Um, so that's F-I-G-U-E-R-O-A at CPPP.org. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up. Uh, 
Thank you for giving me the time to kind of go over some of the opportunities and threats for next session. Um, as you can see, there's a lot more threats and opportunities, um, but I also think there's a lot of hope after the elections we saw um, that maybe this is a year where immigration is a little bit on the back burner. Um, and, but without knowing who the speaker is, without knowing the committees, uh, I'm not prepared to say that yet. So uh, it's absolutely crucial that we keep the pressure on early until we know what, what really is going to be a real threat until the session comes around. So I'm, uh, I'm just going to open it up now. Is that how we're going yes, to do this now? Okay, sounds good. So anybody have any thoughts or questions or ideas? Yeah. We asked you, uh, HB 11 and HB 40, 63, and 68, that's the HBs from last session or this session, those numbers? Those are previous sessions. Previous. All of those bill numbers are previous sessions. Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. There's no bill. The bill filing will start. That's a good point. Bill filing will start November 12th. That's what um, So November 12th, you can go to Texas Legislature online and you can start looking at individual bills, um, and and we'll start tracking it at that point. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Has there been a study that determined what poor policy has caused to? create these situations that we now face regarding immigration and people moving from other countries? Yes, absolutely. And the number of one things that I've seen from the studies, and there may be some academics who are more fluent, but I've seen the number one thing um, that I've, I've seen is that they come for jobs and they come for security. So the Central Americans are coming to flee the violence that are coming from their country uh, and economic opportunity. What I've seen is not the case um, is they don't come for um, for to vote, they don't. They're not coming here because they want to become U.S. citizens. They're not coming because they. Uh, there's no immigrants commit less crimes than um, U.S. residents and le and citizens. Um, so the criminal aspect that Trump keeps talking about uh, is actually completely not in line with any of the research I've seen. Um, and um, and they also don't come for, for really for benefits or even in-state tuition or any of those ec education things, uh, although you know it's important we provide those. Um, the main drivers uh, are essentially economic opportunity and security because they fear for their lives from what I've seen. Yes, ma'am. Wasn't there something recently um, either passed or intended to restrict uh, asylum seekers from having jobs or working while they're waiting for their court dates. Do you know about that? I don't know about that. I do know that they've kind of restricted the um, claims you can bring for asylum, so the, some of the group claims. I know that there was something like that. Lee, do you have any more information on You on can't that? get employment authorization after pending your asylum application. Mm -hmm. Pending your asylum application, but that's Months. been across the board, so, right? Yeah, okay. to years, depending on the case. Yeah. Yeah. That's been in the, that's that's been a regulation for many years. Yeah, that's that's not a new thing, right? Yeah. Okay. I couldn't hear well, but oh, what five she's... days after um, a person has had an initial asylum um, affirmative, mm -hmm. they are allowed to get a work permit. But in fact, it's not happening in 45 days. In this coalition, a lot of people are familiar with Sadat Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. And he was released from Pearsall on August 3rd, mm -hmm. and he was here last week for another hearing, and he still does not have his work permit, and he has a lawyer, mm -hmm. and, and she doesn't know why it hasn't been issued yet. Yeah, yeah no, I don't know. I'm not the expert on that. Definitely consult some attorneys, so screw this, how they claim on your employment authorization. It's, it's my understanding, as they were saying, that if you don't get it well, it's happening, but at some point, you can definitely do it. Yeah, of course. You want to use the microphone now? Any other any other questions? It was a great overview. Thank you. legislative session. Um, okay, this is the time that we, uh, we want our collaborators, people in this group who work in this field every day. Uh, if you have 
report to give, something that you want to let us know about that we uh, can help you with, this is the time. Please come forward. And we'll give you a couple of minutes. You can come in. I, I'm speaking for San Antonio Sands. If you saw at the back, there was an invitation this Saturday at uh, uh, 10 o'clock at 9502 Computer Drive. Um, this is the group that is advocating for the local policies that Mr. F Figueroa was just sharing with us right now. One of the first things that we have heard about in the past was the we were looking for this site and release program which is so that they will not be detained, so they will not go to any kind of jail where the uh, ICE can have a possibility of picking them up. If you saw on this morning's paper, the newly elected DA, Gonzalez, has said this is his first priority. Oh, great. Wow. So it, it looks like a very positive direction for us. And uh, we've, we've been talking with um, Sheriff Salazar for some time about this and each one of the city council members, and I think it's going to go. At this meeting on Saturday morning, uh, we're going to introduce a new kind of a structure for it. And so we invite you all to come if you'd like to be there, the possibilities. I'm sure we'll be talking about the caravan. I'm sure we'll be talking about the elections. Come. Joy. Hi, uh, thanks for allowing me to speak for a moment. Uh, in five months, um, I'm Joyce Hamilton. I'm with the group called Angry Diaz and Abuelas uh, from the Rio Grande Valley. And as Lena said earlier, we initiated on June 3rd when we were told that there were uh, asylum seekers on the bridges, um, particularly the one at Reynosa, south of McAllen. And uh, a group of us, five people from Harlingen, drove the 60 miles or so total to get to the bridge and uh, take water and supplies and find out what they needed. And um, that was the beginning of what could be an entire book <laughs> at this point. But that was the beginning of a group that expanded and 10 days later named itself Angry Diaz and Abuelas. And Jenna actually was with us along with Sister Denise uh, at that meeting because my sister Linda had told me they were on their way down there and um, there was a lot happening at that moment and I wanted to make sure that they joined us at a meeting at Jennifer Harbury's home um, which was called so that we could organize ourselves and figure out what we would want to do. Um, some of you may know that Jennifer Harbury is a civil rights attorney who in the 1980s was in Guatemala and was married to um, a Guatemalan who became a freedom fighter and was um, detained and uh, kidnapped and killed. And she had chained herself to the Guatemalan palace for many days and went on hunger strike and it became a national, a uh, national attention was drawn to what the role of the United States was in Guatemala at that time. And so that was 30 some odd years ago and Jennifer's my age and uh, is living in West Laco, Texas, and uh, is just retired from Texas Re uh, Rural Legal Aid, TRLA. Um, she's very much an activist still. Uh, it was at her house that we met, and um, she is the person who is responsible for releasing the crying children's tape that you all heard. I'm, I'm thinking you did, and which was really the impetus for the executive order to and family separation. So she's one of our guides, really, in everything we do. Um, she's in Mexico City right now, and uh, on our messenger group, she told us this morning um, that they are trying um, to get the caravan, if you will, these many desperate people, families, to take a route other than through Tamaulipas, which is the Mexican state just south of us, that expands from Brownsville through um, Reynosa and a little beyond uh, because of the danger there from the cartels and the very highly organized coyotes there, um, which is something we've been observing all summer. And um, 
it gets far more complicated than that, but I'll just simplify it to say that angry tias and abuelas, uh, since the, that point five months ago, have become involved in the bus stations in McAllen and Brownsville, uh, where those families that, and, and single people who have been released from detention and are in the process of seeking asylum are dropped off or are taken to before they get on their buses to go across the country to their sponsors and family members. Um, so that increased from hundreds to up to, well, maybe 100 a day up to about 500 a day mm -hmm. last week. Um, that's an average, maybe from 200 to 500 or something in that range. And um, we have volunteers who've been there since the end of June, um, committing their lives Monday through Friday, um, alternating days now in order to prevent burnout, trying to help people uh, with their itineraries, to help them understand their itineraries, um, and to show them maps of where they're going, help them with just a myriad list of needs. Um, those people have been either released from Catholic Charities um, Sacred Heart Respite Center, which is a block and a half from the McAllen bus station, or in Brownsville, they've been essentially dumped by ICE at the bus station, and we have an incredible network of people in Brownsville from the community who form a support network to provide those people food and all those things that Catholic Charities does in McAllen. So it's been an amazing five months of community groups coming together and uh, reaching out and just literally message groups going 24-7 to let people know, okay, we just got 10 people just arrived on the bridge here. Okay, 25 people just came in, were dropped in Brownsville. Station closes at 11. What are we going to do with these people for the night until the bus leaves in the morning? You know, really situations like that that um, have been really rough. Uh, just one thing in closing here is that um, I, in our messenger group this morning, we learned that um, Trump, uh, either today or tomorrow, will be announcing his new policy and uh, mentioning the birthright citizenship aspect that you just you know, all know about and heard about, um, the ending, his desire to end birthright citizenship, as well as the intent, and this is really important to us down there right now, and to you at the bus stations here, to detain people at the border and put them into detention for longer periods of time, maybe indefinitely, so that we would not be seeing them at the bus stations anytime soon which sounds like large detention facilities like Tornillo and El Paso. Um, so um, I guess watch TV in the next day or so and see what horrors lie out there next. So, and, and thanks to my sister Linda for, um, and IWC for giving us all of their uh, background on how to form a good backpack program because that's the base that we worked from when we started our backpack program. This is uh, Christina Mendez, Mendez, right? Okay, Mendez, uh, from P16 Plus. We'll just hear a little bit back on those of you who want to make a report, please start coming up this way. Can we get them lined up like we did last well, time? Well, I'm so trying. <laughs> Any of you who want to do this, please come forward so we can kind of push you through. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Christina Mendez. I work with P16 Plus and we do services for Collective Impact. Our network, People on Mass, um, specifically focuses on dreamers. So what we're working on right now is helping them transition to college. So we're working with our seven higher institutions, getting resources, questions, and outlining it all in one spot so that it's easy to advise students. And our other piece that we just um, planned, started planning yesterday was that we're going to host a conference for educators, administrators, and community members specifically about the K-12 system and the higher ed system. So how to support our immigrant students and communities in those systems already. So if you're interested, I'll stick around after the meeting. Thank you. Okay, just to let you know, this is not a line of disrespect. It's just we want to get all the information, but as quickly as possible. Okay, and Three things. One, um, I'm kind of in decreasing order of importance, but 
Um, I attended the Parliament of World Religions this last weekend in Toronto. 10,000 people of faith from all over the world. Um, you're going to ask me for details, but I'm not going to have them. But I am telling you that it was announced by that parliament. Jim Wallace with Sojourners in BC started the call. Um, Richard Rohr is involved with that. Um, the chair of the parliament. But they're working on meeting the caravan in Mexico and walking with them across the border at least one to one. So if there were 7,000, there were 7,000. So one person walking with one person. Again, that's all the details I have. But just so you know, if that information, I will feed it when I get it, but that's all I know. Does it have a name? No, that's all the details I have. Okay. Can you name the, name the organization again, the meeting? The meeting was a Parliament of World Religions. Okay. Um, the second thing, and this is just information and you can do with it what you want, but if you're interested, give me your name and I'll connect you. But the Seattle Peace Choir is going to be in San Antonio January 23rd through 26th. They are coming specifically because of what is happening in terms of folks coming across the border and immigrants. Um, and they're, I, I hear they're a fabulous choir and they want to offer their song, however that could be at whatever events that you might already have. I've suggested to them that they sing at the bus station and at the airport, and they're doing some other things. But if you have an event in your head or something that they would be helpful to have them come, um, give me your name and your email and I'll connect you with them directly. And the last thing, the Faith-Based Initiative Immigration and Refugee Action Team will be meeting right after this, and we look at ways of how to leverage and strategically engage congregations. So if you want to be a part of that conversation, stay. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ogre Kaufman, and today I'm representing VITA, Reform Immigration for Texas Alliance, and I just wanted to... Um, give you some information. We are having a statewide meeting getting ready for the session and it's going to be in San Antonio and it'll be at the uh, Raices office at 802 Kentucky and it starts at 1030 and it'll be a, a day long meeting probably till around five o'clock and we have people coming in from Houston, Dallas, the Valley, uh, El Paso and uh, some Western Lubbock, so, so there'll be people from all over. Uh, so I hope some of you all can attend. I know it's late notice. Uh, we also have um, we have uh, a, a way to register, but I don't have the, the link with me. But I, if I can send it to one of the IWC uh, people, you can, maybe you can do an email and send it out. But uh, this is a very important meeting, getting ready for the session. In the past, we've, we've, had, uh, we've had Luis Figueroa train us, and he did a great job. So uh, we spent a lot of time in Austin uh, lobbying. So I hope that some of you can come and maybe help us out during the session. I know we're all going to be doing work during the session. Maybe we can coordinate some more. So again, this Saturday at, at Raices on Kentucky. Yes, ma'am. Rita, Reform Immigration for Texas Alliance, it's based out of El Paso, sponsored by the Border Network for Human Rights, and they're the ones that organize the statewide coalition. Okay, I'll send it to, to Lena, and then she can set the, the registration. There's no charge. We just kind of want to have an idea about how many people will be there. Any more questions? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Mariela, and I oversee the West Station Project for Raices. Um, I'm really excited to share that since the beginning of our project in May, we have provided legal orientations to more than 2,000 families and have referred many of these families to our partners out in LA, Atlanta, Charlotte, Kansas City, Philadelphia, and Boston. And we are continuously working on expanding that network so that we can continue to refer families out. 
Um, I also want to share that we now have a point of contact for overnight shelter needs for single men and then dads and their sons. This will be at Posada Guadalupe and our point of contact there will be Veronica Cardona. And I'm Nate Roeder, also with Raices. Um, just kind of a general update on some more of our programs and one event plug. Um, so at the ICE liaison meeting with the director of the Pearsall Detention Center, many of you know people released from Pearsall sometimes show up at the airport and the bus station at 3, 4 a.m. Um, we're trying to change that and apparently that was a surprise to ICE, they had no idea. Um, so hopefully we'll see something a little more reasonable. They said they could do better. Um, we're still paying bonds for parents that were separated from their children under zero tolerance and also children who were separated from their parents who have since aged out of, uh, of, of custody and are now in ICE detention. Um, but fewer and fewer um, because the people who are bond eligible mostly have been released. But um, there's a large contingent of people who, who remain in detention. Um, particularly in family detention in Carnes and Dilly, we're eagerly awaiting the results and the release plans for all of the uh, dads who are in Carnes with their sons and the moms who are in Dilly with their kids. There's still, um, I think, around 100 uh, family units. And we hope they get released uh, once they get their, their positives on their credible fear interviews, triggering the asylum cases. And if they don't get released after those positives, uh, we're gonna have to, to really um, step up on that. So we're hoping for anything good there. Um, also, we're paying attention to the new attorney general to see what, uh, what they're going to do about the cases that Sessions had remanded to himself. Um, you talked about the Flores settlement was one of them. Another is kind of a more tricky one having to do with bonds and release on bond for people who uh, who were detained right after crossing the border. We filed an amicus brief, brief along with a bunch of organizations, including the uh, Sarah Ramey's one, Migrant Center for Human Rights out of Pearsall, um, kind of voicing our opinion that we don't want to see policies that would go into more indefinite detention. So we're hoping that those just get dropped. and. Uh, and we start to see more avenues for release for people, which is really just maintaining the already terrible status quo. Um, and the event that I want to plug at Tuesdays at Raices, which is the first Tuesday of every month. Um, we didn't do it this Tuesday because it was the election. So that's going to be next Tuesday, um, like five days from now at 802 Kentucky. It's a movie showing. Uh, of Sueños de Cartón, which is Cardboard Dreams. Uh, it's about growing up undocumented in Texas. Um, so I hope you can join us for that and going forward every first Tuesday of, uh, of each month. What time? Six o'clock. I think it's six o'clock. <laughs> it is six o'clock. There will be a Facebook event. Yeah. Great. Uh, Nate? Yes. That 20 million plus that you all got yes. for bonds, is it limited? to families that were separated, or can it be used for other families that are in detention but weren't involved at the time of the separation? From the Facebook fundraiser, a lot of that is going up to scaling our... Uh, Just talk slower. Yeah, that, from that Facebook fundraiser, a lot is going into scaling up our legal programs um, statewide to deal with uh, people in detention. My Mostly, question is, can that money be used for people in detention that weren't involved in the family separation? Uh, a lot of it is, yeah. It can be? Uh, it is. Thank you. Yeah. Is this your last time? Or? No. Okay. Uh, more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, Tino Vallegos. I'm the immigration liaison for the city of San Antonio. I just have a few things. Um, First off, the city, we're preparing some formal comments on the proposed public charge rule change uh, that, that are due uh, on December the 10th. For those of you who have heard about the public charge rule change, it would be a huge change in the way that um, immigration law is being applied for people who are applying to become particularly legal permanent residents. Um, the, the, under the rule change, they're, they're, they're changing the way that they're looking at people's, uh, people's eligibility to become legal permanent residents. 
And it's much more really than just whether or not they used public benefits in the past. They're taking a, a, a look at many different factors to decide whether or not someone will even be eligible to become a, a lawful permanent resident of the United States. And this really, it kind of starts to look like the merits-based system that, the, the, that has been proposed because they're looking at things like the age of the person who's applying, their, their health condition of themselves, the level of education, whether they can speak English, uh, their educational background, and if somebody doesn't meet those requirements, whether or not they had any problems in the past with immigration, whether or not they had uh, any re receipt of food stamps in their family, it will not matter, they will be denied. So this is something that the city is very concerned with, uh, and we are, we are preparing, some public com preparing some comments together with our, um, our public health department. We've also assisted the, the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, who is also submitting comments on behalf of the chamber on that issue. Um, I encourage everyone uh, who, in any organizations, to make comments on this issue. And then we can talk a little bit about, but there's a lot of different organizations that are strategizing on this, but they can talk about some of the ways that they make effective comments. The city is also talking to some of its citizenship service stakeholders. Um, and we're trying to increase the number of citizenship workshops and finding more venues for naturalization. Our local USAS office has told us that the number of naturalization applications has consistently been high over the last couple of years, which is really great news. Many people are becoming citizens and become a citizen, can't be deported, which is really great. You can also apply for some of your own family members, which is also really great. And you can vote. So uh, there's, they're experiencing a very, very high volume of people who are trying to naturalize, and they have a lot of need for venues to be able to hold naturalization ceremonies, the large ones uh, around town. So we're trying to assist them in that. We're also trying to assist uh, our, our local organizations who help uh, either provide citizenship classes, uh, English as a second language classes, um, and, uh, and assist people in filling out the N-400 form, which is what you use to become a citizen, um, in getting those in so that they, they, can, they can all um, have their applications in. Because of the backlog as it currently is, it's about 12 months of a wait time between the time you apply and the time that you're going to have your interview. So we're telling people, um, starting next year, if you want to actually vote in the 2020 elections, you're going to have to get your application into, into the queue um, sometime in the spring in order to first have it approved, you take the oath and be sworn in, and then finally uh, you have to register 30 days before the election to be able to vote. So it is, it is a message we're trying to get out there, and um, hopefully we'll be able to offer some support in organizing some more events to help people along that process. I am um, asking for, for people to save the date. Uh, December 3rd, I have um, a, a date saved to use the San Antonio Central Library Auditorium. I want to have a convening event on healthcare and immigration. I've had a lot of people come and talk to me about different things, uh, talk, touching on healthcare and immigrants, when it, whether it's um, public clinics at the bus station to serve that population, or if people wanted to have a medical legal partnership, which is having lawyers at, uh, at hospitals and clinics. Uh, there's been lots of different ideas floating around. I think that it's a good, it's a good time to bring people together and kind of talk about those and start to, to see what we can do together to, to make some of those proposals happen. So uh, save the date, um, December the 3rd, 1 to 4 p.m. at the Central Library Auditorium. Uh, Did you give a time? At 1 to 4, yeah, that's why I have a reservation for. But always important, you gotta get those reservation times in there. <laughs> And they won't just take the date. So um, finally, the legal services contracts that the city was, was providing, you know, we're in the second year of that. We are still funding Rice's Catholic Charities and American Gateways to provide um, legal services uh, for families facing uh, removal. Um, the, the main um, uh, qualifications for services there, you have to be a San Antonio city resident and you have to have 125% uh, federal poverty guidelines. Um, the idea is you just can go into either one of those providers, and, and, and if you're a San Antonio resident, they'll see if they have space for you in, in this program, and, and it should be 100% free um, for the legal services. Finally, um, there's a couple of things. Uh, I, I just got here from Forced From Home, the Doctors Without Borders presentation that was the exhibit that's there next to the, to the uh, Courthouse. I don't know if, any of, if many of you have seen it. It's a really, really great presentation. It's, it actually overlaps a lot with what, what this group does. And, uh, and you all are on their list of, of things that people can do to take action, so that's really great. 
But for those who have it, the Force from Home, uh, Dr. Zoll Flores exhibit, highly recommended it only be here until Sunday, so um, a limited time. I think it takes about an hour to get all the way through it, but they really kind of walk you through like what it's like to be a refugee and, and the, the challenges you face in every single stage of, of being forced from home, leaving home, what you take with you, you know, when you arrive at a camp, you know, the, the choices you have to make there, how you get to a safe country, and, and they, they, they have actual doctors who have done um, work in those countries that talk about their experiences. So it is really a great exhibit. Finally, uh, we are transitioning to a new immigration liaison. I will be transitioning out of this job. It's going to be a, a while um, because I committed to serving as immigration liaison until we hire someone else. So our, may, our estimate is probably January, somewhere mid-January at the earliest. Could be later, depending on whether we can get all our interviews done in time. So um, I, you will be seeing me at least a couple more times. And if you have any questions? I have a couple. That Doctors Without Border, is it just in the evening or is it day long set it's, up? It starts, it starts uh, at 9, so I guess it goes 9 to 12 and then 1 to 5. But, but the first sessions are filled with uh, students from schools, more, mostly. So 4 to 8 is the better public time. Is it? And okay. on, on weekdays and on Saturday and Sunday, it'll be 10 to 6. Yes. I went, I went this morning, for example, I went at 9, and that was fine. Oh, was it? Yeah. Well, don't they, go much have, later, because yeah. I did, and I got into three right. school groups, and it was... Nice. I guess they're going like every eight minutes is the... <laughs> There's the higher, higher yeah. the I, I have a second question. Just yes, really, on that public charge bill, are they still making an exception for Cuban, in, Cuban coming across? Yes, it's my understanding that there are many categories of people it doesn't apply to, so really this... this there, there are, you know, your usual vulnerable groups that are excluded from the public charge. Um, VAWA, uh, people seeking to have VAWA status, people with U, U or T visa, who came to the United States and U and T visa, and they're adjusting that way. Um, I think Cuban Haitian entrants probably are still going to be um, exempt from this requirement. But if you're like doing a family-based petition, which is the vast majority of, of our, our people who are trying to become legal permanent residents, this, this is going to apply to you. And this is in addition to the requirement that maybe you that you heard of, of having a sponsor file an affidavit, an affidavit of support, a legally binding contract that says that if the person is going to go on public benefits, then you as the sponsor will pay for them, right? That's, that's a requirement now. That will continue to be in effect, plus they're going to have these additional requirements. Um, so this is, this is a very important rule change. It's, it's been kind of flying under the radar. It's very confusing and, and hard to follow, but um, we are trying to, uh, at the very least, get San Antonio's perspective uh, into into the conversation at the federal rulemaking level. Can I uh, mention also we so CTRP has been really involved on this issue in particular, and Dunkelberg is one of the leading experts on this. If you go to that blog site, there's a ton of materials on there. There will be sample comments. We're going to be uh, spending the next two weeks organizing around this. We were waiting till after the election to really uh, you know talk about it. Um, but please visit our, our site because Ann Dunkelberg has, has been really organizing the, the state around this issue. So thank you, Tina. Yeah, she's been very helpful to me. Great, I'm glad to hear it. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Raya. I'm an intern with the Migrant Center for Human Rights. Um, I have a few brief updates. The first is that we've, rec in we've received an increase in requests from asylum seekers in detention at Pearsall from uh, Cameroon and the Congo. Um, I think last week we received, I, I wanna say 10 letters from individuals requesting help. Um, additionally, uh, well, so the Migrant Center is based in San Antonio. We work just down the street, but we work at Pearsall. So I was at Pearsall yesterday doing visits, and um, there we, I was finally able to meet with an individual who was in quarantine for three weeks. There were about 30 to 40 people in quarantine, I believe. And so this was an individual that had been um, on our list for several weeks, but we were told that we were not able to meet with them because they were on um, medical security. And so um, obviously we, we uh, were not able to know what was wrong with them or when they would be out because um, that would be breach of privacy. But um, I think those are things that we need to know as people who, who want to help them. So I finally met with this individual and there was another individual on my list uh, who was also a medical quarantine that we weren't able to meet with. Um, but this individual had said that they 
were released from quarantine three days ago um, and just had their credible fear interview. So there's a bit of a backlog for a lot of the people who um, uh, were sick. And, and I don't know exactly what was going around. I heard chicken pox, but the individual I met with had the mumps. Um, additionally, uh, the Migrant Center for Human Rights recently kicked off our Human Rights Learning Program, which is a workshop where we go into local high schools and we talk about um, everything that has to do with immigration. We, we do an overview of immigration and asylum law and do um, little uh, case uh, studies with students. So we'll present them with a case and ask them, um, do they think this person uh, will like, receive asylum or, or a cat or withholding of removal? And uh, it was really exciting because I, I think uh, you know, as you can imagine, we're all outraged by, by the state of immigration, but these high school students think it's absolutely ridiculous um, just how immigration law works. And um, we're also looking for underwriters for this program. So we recently went to Kip High School and did workshops with Spanish classes, and uh, soon we're going to be going into um, Alamo Heights High School and doing workshops with students there. So if you're interested in underwriting this program, or if you're a teacher, or if you know any teachers who would be interested in inviting us into their classrooms, uh, we'd be so appreciative. And one more thing, um, I don't know how many of you are signed up for our newsletter, um, but I'm gonna pass around a newsletter sign up to both sides of the room. Um, and I'm also, so recently we updated our newsletter, now it uh, is like, I think it looks better. I updated it, but <laughs> um, now it's like um, via email, and it's a little bit more. Um, it's use. It's more user friendly. So unfortunately, I don't have a very good example of the the digital newsletter. But what I do have are the articles that were included on our newsletter and our old uh, physical newsletter. So please, please sign up for our newsletters. I work really hard on them, but also there are really good <laughs> updates on all things to do, um, all things immigration and what we're up to at the Migrant Center. So I'm gonna pass around sign-up sheets and then some examples of our old newsletters. Please sign up. So this is um, an immigrant voice story, so it talks about somebody's difficulty in gathering evidence in detention. Um, as you can imagine, it can be pretty difficult when you don't ha have access to certain resources to build a strong case. And then um, this is a policy analysis by the executive director, Sarah Ramey, talking about um, how uh, asylum seekers have a right to bond. So please take a look at that. All right. Ah! Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Good morning, everybody. My name is Drew Galloway from Move Texas. Um, I will give a quick civics update on our work uh, and then go into our immigration uh, program. So uh, youth turnout, I'm proud to announce, was 568% uh, up in Texas over the 2014 election. Um, and uh, just in Bear County, there was two full turnout points up over that amount, like the state average. So Bear County actually outperformed, outperformed the state. Um, for the year so far, we've registered uh, a little over 29,000 students by hand. Uh, we have uh, distributed 239,000 voter guides, uh, which includes uh, immigration issues that are important to young people. Uh, this cycle, we went and knocked on 20,000 doors, made 14,000 phone calls, and sent 73,000 text messages, including 19,000 conversations through those text messages with other young people. Um, and we are getting ready to uh, begin registering students for the city of San Antonio election. So it's been an exciting cycle. Um, for our immig immigration justice program, uh, we are working hand in hand with uh, SA Stands on site and release here in San Antonio. Uh, we've been meeting with city council people and uh, hope to have draft memos on everybody's desk uh, by late November. Uh, we are also meeting with the uh, San Antonio Library, uh, with the director of the library uh, to inquire if we can make library cards as part of identification for site and release uh, to, ver to, to sort of make the available site, uh, IDs um, more varied. Uh, we have two Know Your Rights sessions coming up uh, this month. One is in Seguin at Texas Lutheran College or University. At, that's gonna be on the 28th 
Um, and then we have one uh, later this month in San Antonio that will be announced on Facebook later this, uh, this week. Uh, our Know Your Rights uh, graphic novel is finalized and going to print. Uh, we'll be distri distributing uh, print and digital versions of this uh, document, uh, which is a uh, visual ver version of Know Your Rights uh, that, that's more targeted towards uh, under 30 uh, individuals. Um, and then also we have a college campus SB4 handbook, uh, which is uh, more of a policy manual on campus police and how uh, SB4 <coughs> impacts universities. Uh, we're doing that um, hand in hand with SA Rise. Uh, currently we're seeking student input on several of our campuses on the finalized document and that will go through print and digital distribution throughout Texas as well. And finally, uh, for the first session ever, we'll, uh, we will be working in the Texas Ledge session uh, on a youth agenda, and we hope to release that in early December. So, thank you so much. Can you name your group again? Sure, that was MOVE, M-O-V-E, all capitalized, okay. Texas. And it stands for Mobilize, Organize, Vote, and Empower. We're a nonpartisan grassroots organization building power for young people. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Very quickly, um, I, I run Nowcast SA, which is a nonprofit, local, independent, <coughs> online news organization. We um, have covered Interface Welcome Coalition since it was first um, dreamt up. And I wanted to let you know that um, two things. One, this year um, we were accepted um, as uh, with a challenge grant from the Knight Foundation, the Democracy Fund, and the McCarthy Foundation. They will match any donation, individual donation to Nowcast SA up to $1,000 this year through December 31st. And if you um, are able to uh, sign up for a monthly uh, uh, donation for as little as $5 a month, the Knight Foundation will match at the annual rate. So if you contribute $5 a month, they will contribute 60. If you contribute $50 a month, they will contribute 600 immediately to us. And it's very important. Um, and also, if you are not receiving our newsletter, uh, you can uh, text free update to 66866, and you can get onto our newsletter list so you can get all the information about, including others, Interfaith Welcome Coalition. I'm going to do my best to see that we are finished by 11.30. So, Sister Sharon, would you please come report on the bus station? Were you supposed to do that? No. Who was supposed to? Because I know that Sister Denise is not here. Okay. Well, it was anyone asked by Sister Denise? Yes, I was. But I was ready for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to move? Let me, uh, let's see. Okay. Are you ready? I, I was waiting for the other ones, the other groups. This will be short. Sister Denise has said that uh, that she gave the number of backpacks that we have given this year, this month. Which month? This past month. October. 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 1,778 backpacks last month. The most in one month so far this year. About 70 to 110 families a day we receive, depending on if it's the beginning or the end of the week. The media publicity has brought us more Spanish speaking volunteers. Linda? Uh, Jane Fried is traveling, so Linda Lumley will report on the backpacks. And I'll be glad when Jane gets back. Uh, we're getting more and more interest, which is really a great thing. Uh, people are wanting to come in and help us pack backpacks. They're wanting to pack them and bring them to us. They don't want to just donate money. They really want to do something tangible. So we've had lots and lots of emails, and that's a great thing. Uh, last Monday, we packed the very most we've ever packed. We packed 450 backpacks. We were there for four hours. Uh, this week, I've gotten requests from people to go out and do little workshops to let them know how to pack the backpacks and what to put in them. So it's very exciting, but we could use more volunteers. <laughs> and after doing this for Jane, she needs more help. <laughs> and since I'm the numbers person, uh, 
as of October 31st, uh, we have delivered to the bus station and the airport 17,187 backpacks this year. Say that wow. again. 17,187 backpacks as of October 31st. Last year, we delivered a little bit shy of 5,000. 490. 4,000. Um, okay, are uh, Joe, is Joe here or is John? John. Oh, John, you're here. We forced Joe to go on vacation. Oh, well, good. She needed it. This um, is John Garland. Yeah. I would just say this is about hospitality, and I think since our last meeting, we've hosted um, in, in conjunction, there's a really wonderful collaboration between Catholic Charities and RAISIS and the Interfaith Welcome Coalition, and then individual homes that are opening up. Um, and there's the Casa Nacho, run by the Catholic Charities, and the Casa de Maria Marta, run by the, um, the Mennonite Church, where I'm the pastor. And since our last meeting, we've hosted well over 100 folks. Um, and uh, Jeffrey, who's here in the back here, is doing a lot of transportation. Um, we are Mennonites, he's a Catholic, but we are building a statue of him in our church. <laughs> That's amazing work uh, that he's doing. Um, a number of people have been through sort of a trauma-informed hospitality training that we've been offering every other week, more or less. And it's very, very basic. Um, it just says, this is what hospitality is like when you're working with traumatized folks. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention is that this is the season that a lot of folks are getting sick um, at the bus station um, and at the airports. And so if you need to be, have your hands laid on you today because you've been ill and you're feeling it, come on. I think Mariella's been sick maybe three or four times in the last couple, right? And, uh, and Nate has been spending a lot of time at the bus station, so pass him some tissues um, and, 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 uh, and give a lot of, um, a lot of gentle uh, kindness. This is why we sent Joe away for uh, vacation. John? Yeah. You you said you're offering trauma-informed mm -hmm. hospitality training. When does that happen? It's generally on Wednesday nights, uh, and we'll, 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 if we're if you haven't gotten the invitation, that means that we did not do a good job sending them out. Um, but we've we've trained maybe 60 or so folks in the last uh, couple of weeks. It's just a very it's a one-hour training um, talking about um, uh, based on um, uh, how, especially with men, uh, how to res how to um, engage with women who've been sexually traumatized, um, and then also uh, how to make uh, in a, uh, increase felt safety with children and with adults uh, when they're in a very different space and they need they need to rest. So it's just there's lots of there's lots of study out there and there's a lot of really neat tips, um, and it's just a matter of you know running through those. Thank you. I'm sorry, Sister Sharon. I skipped a whole section, and that's what threw you off. Uh, Sister Pat, do you have anything on education or advocacy? I'm sorry. Advocacy that you want to talk about? Also, Mary Grace, do you want to come up later and talk about the sanctuary? I want to just say while she's walking okay. up, if you're here for the first time from your faith community or your organization and would be willing to be a point person for that group, please let me know or put a star by your name on the sign in. Oh, I just, I totally went to the end of this. I was trying to get us through this. I'm trying to meet our schedule right Yeah, right. We will have an advocacy meeting, the IWC advocacy meeting, directly after this one, probably this corner up here. Um, a number of our people belong to the different groups that have given reports. Thanks to Sharon and to uh, Lucretia and her husband, they came up with the need to collaborate because we realized early on as we began how complex these things are in terms of both service as well as advocacy. So drawing from the best of what's coming out of people's hearts, minds, and, and uh, wills, uh, we have uh, gathered this uh, advocacy committee which is going to keep improving, I'm sure, as we get out there and get um, bring from our different collaborators what their expertise is and what we need to do in this next session in Texas and ongoing federally, but it's not so surprise. Okay, what is what you should have picked up, I hope, at the back. We did have Texas Impact do a training with us, thanks to Father, I shouldn't say Father, Reverend George, and on um, October 30th, and it was quite excellent. And so there's a summary of that, and especially on page two and three, 
Um, and two in the bottom, uh, Texas Impacts Resources, they do a weekly witness every week during the whole session, which is helpful. And then also on the other page, page three, under necessary tools, and uh, the uh, important that you put in your computer immediately, capital.text.gov, where it has a lot of information that's helpful for advocacy. And also, gave out this sheet that Texas Impact gave us. We need to know our legislators. We're building relationships with them now. You know pretty much who's been elected and whatever. So this lawmaker information sheet is for you to fill out so that as you go uh, about the business of being actually God's voice in care of those who are most vulnerable, that you gather this kind of information and more in order to be able to relate well to the people that we expect to do the work that we need to do together. And on the back, I have just a few points. Um, we have some real uh, veterans on our advocacy committee. Sir Jean Thomas Dwyer is one of them. Um, Olga, who just spoke recently with, is very much one of them. And also Meg, who is from the Presbyterian um, advocacy, as well as from the League of Women Voters. And they are, they're veterans. So JT, I asked JT what I could put on here. Knowing that we're not starting a lot of the legislative work really uh, until the first of the year or thereabouts, and so there are a few points for you to consider, and you can read them. So I'm not going to say them and again. The um, being sure that you put into your computer that particular website, the uh, capitaltexas.gov, is really really important. And I don't know about you, but I've been so inspired today by the groups. The voting was great. And where's the guy from Texas? Right. Texas. Texas. I think I, I think I got all 73,000 of your tweets. So just one thing on you. You're in my box. You're in my everything. And eventually I said, my God, it's two hours before the polls called. Closing, and they were still doing it. So talk about enthusiasm. It's great. Gee, I can I say a word to the group? Sure. She's my expert at home <laughs> and elsewhere. You know, Luis had to leave, but he gave us incredible information this morning. I just want to emphasize in relation to the sheet that Sister Pat just held it up and what Luis said. Some of us worked incredibly hard in the last session to try to kill the bill that would have licensed Carnes and Dilly. Do you hear what Louise said? Why was that bill killed? Look down on the sheet, and you picked it up on the table. And one of the things that asks you to find out about your representative is his faith tradition. People, that bill died because the director of the Texas Catholic Conference and Bishop Burns of Dallas visited with Brian Cook, the chair of that committee that helped the bill. And he sat on it. It had passed the Senate, as Louise told you. It was in the committee in the House to be heard, State Affairs. The Senate bill came over, thank God Strauss put it to state affairs, and so Brian Cook had control of those two bills. And because of his Catholic upbringing, that's what Luis told you, you have to really research on that paper that Sister Pat left on the table for you to fill out. Now there's a little problem. A great number of you have a new senator or a new representative. And up on that website, you only have the people, it only has from the 85th session. You won't get detailed information off that website for the newly elected state people. So you'll have to go to other sources. But many of you have people that served in the 85th and will be serving again in the 86th. And you can get information about them. Thank you.
I'll be next. Uh, Sister Susan Mika, for those that are new, I'm with the Benedictine Sisters, our monasteries in Bernie, and uh, I'm sorry we had to leave, but we're the ones that started the Center for Public Policy Priorities in around 1985, and uh, Finally, we're getting someone now that's going to be working on some of these other issues. We've been pushing the center to do that, so yes. <laughs> um, we're the ones, uh, our Benedictine office, uh, Ruben is my assistant, he's here in the back. We put together, we see ourselves as uh, part of the whole coalition, but documenting uh, the, a lot of the uh, articles and the different court cases that are going on. So uh, at every meeting, we try to pass out uh, this, uh, now it's gotten to be a number of pages. Uh, we say immigrant family detention update. So those of you that are new, please pick up one. Uh, we'll put it into a PDF after this meeting because we always get other information maybe that we didn't have uh, before the meeting and we try to update everything and then send it to the leaders of our coalition to post. And um, so, uh, and we actually made the font bigger on the first page, and so it went over into the second page. We've been promising you that we were gonna try to do that. So then we uh, now uh, put the activities uh, on the second page, and um, so, and thank you, uh, Tino, for that. We use a lot of the information that comes from the different sources to try to, and many of these, uh, activities have been mentioned already today and then the third section is the article so we subscribe to some of these newspapers so that we can try to you know actually capture those articles and Ruben does a summary and puts the link there so if you need more information and I just want I mean of course like this time it's mostly on the caravan also the troops going to the border and then um, on the very end, on the very back page there, uh, the Fed signed a new contract with Dilly. And uh, we had mentioned that before, that we figured that that is what was gonna happen when the other small cities said that they were no longer going to uh, have that contract. So they have, and there's a lot of details in that article, <laughs> kind of mind-boggling, you know, in many ways. and. And you know, a part of our other work is with shareholder advocacy. Uh, we uh, sometimes own shares in some of the companies where we raise questions. And uh, since there's so many new people today, I reported at the last meeting that um, I was just in New York at the beginning of October and we met with uh, Core Civic. A uh, number of the shareholders, the Jesuits, are actually raising, or they're leading that dialogue. And so, questions about, like, are you working on a human rights policy? And then also, they're working on, like, a sustainability report. Many of the companies now are annually publishing sustainability reports. So I, I was at the meeting able to raise a lot of nitty gritty questions uh, on behalf of like our group and others uh, about you know what's going on in Dilly because that was, of course, Civic is the one that runs Dilly. And um, we just got a press release this morning um, from uh, CalSTRS, the California State Teachers Retirement System voted, the board voted uh, yesterday to divest from for-profit prisons. So they're gonna be selling their shares of Core Civic and the GEO Group. The GEO Group is the one that runs uh, CARNS. So um, very interesting and they're saying that this is gonna put pressure on the um, uh, CalSTRS, which is the California Public Employees Retirement System, because oftentimes they go in tandem. So the one now, the uh, teacher retirement one, CalSTRS, just voted yesterday to do this. So we'll also put this uh, press release with all of the information that we'll send and make into a PDF. So thanks so much. Jean, you want to come up? I totally skipped a whole middle section of this agenda, so Jean will, it's our treasurer. Hi, we're running late, so let me just summarize very quickly. We're taking money in, we're spending money. But we're taking more money in, and we're spending. That's good. <laughs> While uh, Mary Grace is coming up, in terms of fundraising, um, we have done that. The reason we have more money is that we have had people who've been very generous to us this year. Now we're starting to worry about next year <laughs> uh, because it, you know it's coming. 
So uh, that's what we're working on right now is our budget so that we can start the process. If any of you have contacts or links to funding sources, please give them to me because that's how we've done this. Thank you. I don't see Moon or Natalie, but I wanted to remind everyone of our accompaniment training. Um, this is a program where we accompany women or men um, to their ice check-ins, hearings, or uh, ankle monitor check-ins. And the training, you, Spanish is not a requirement. Um, the training is going to be next Tuesday night at First Unitarian Universalist Church at the crossroads of I-10 and 410, easy to find, hard to get to. But we're going to make you a sandwich if you come. Come at 6.30 for sandwiches or at 7 for the training itself. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think most of these things have been uh, announced, but uh, a bit. Okay, so the Doctors Without Borders uh, exhibit, fourth, November 4th through the 11th, please go see that. This evening, in conjunction with that, there is a thing at the UTL Science Center, um, Holly Auditorium, uh, called Bearing Witness, and uh, it again is in conjunction with this uh, exhibit. And um, the accompaniment training. Um, did you announce that? You just announced that. Right. Okay. I think that's it. Yes. So, is there anything else? I want to thank you. I want to thank every person that is here that is showing interest in this issue. I want to thank our collaborators. All these young folk here, I'm old so I can call them young. All of these folk who come up and give their reports on what they're doing, that makes us relevant because we know that a lot of people immediate thing that's going on. So um, as we close, thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. And we will have a meeting in December, so please come. Uh, it's, I think, the 13th. Yeah, December 13th. So please come. Thank you. Oh! Advocacy. Advocacy. Oh, my gosh. We have a meeting. Oh, the meeting, yes. But, okay, did you do what you wanted to do? Gosh, Terry. Okay, there will be an advocacy uh, meeting right somewhere after this meeting, and there's also going to be the faith-based initiative on immigration committee that leads here somewhere. Thank you. <laughs>